Good morning, church. Welcome to Community Bible. Um, we are going to begin worship today. Um, uh, if you would stand with me and read. We're going to read Psalm 145, 1 through 9. If you're in the hallway, go ahead and make your way in and find a seat. Thank you so much. Okay. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is over all that he has made. Please remain standing and join us as we start our worship this morning with How Can I Keep From Singing? There is an endless song echoes in my soul. Well, good morning and welcome to Community Bible Church. It is a blessing to see you here today. This is the Lord's Day and it is our great privilege and responsibility on this day to worship Jesus Christ as our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, let me begin with a couple of announcements and then we will have time for prayer and also for our worship through giving. 
First of all, uh, today is care groups, so you are invited to participate in one of our care groups, except there's a couple of little details that you need to know. First of all, um, the care group that would normally meet at the Brokops can't meet today because there's sickness at the Brokop home. So you'll just have to wait until next month. Or if you brought food and you're kind of ready to go, you're welcome to come to my house. The address is there, and our care group is on and will be meeting uh, this afternoon after church. The same for the young singles, the college age uh, singles at the Divine's home. Their address is there. And then the foreman's care group is going to meet in a couple of weeks. They have kind of within their group set up a different schedule for the month of October. So care groups meeting uh, details are there in the bulletin. Also, there are a number of different uh, things related to Operation Christmas Child that are going on this week. Please note that there in the bulletin that uh, ministry, if you're not familiar already, is sending out Christmas gifts in little shoe boxes. So kind of Christmas shoebox ministry that goes out at Christmas time to minister to needy children around the world. Again, if you want to participate in some of those things, see the bulletin there for details. And then uh, there's one small mistake, if I understand it correctly. This Friday, this Friday, there's a youth group meeting, but not at the Gore's house, at the Fitzhenry's house. Am I still correct on that? It's a bonfire at the Fitzhenry's house that does not end at 8 o'clock. So meet at your house at 6 o'clock. It usually goes till about 10, if I remember correctly. All right, so... Um, Again, if you need some more details, see one of the Fitzhenry's after the service about that. Well, ushers, if you guys don't mind, come on, on to the front. Um, we're going to highlight one of our missionaries to pray for. Of course, as a part of the ministry of Community Bible Church, uh, some portion of every offering goes to ministry or missionaries somewhere, either here in our community, uh, through our own church here, or through a missionary around the world. This missionary is very dear to my heart. It's my sister. My little sister, Karen, uh, serves in pre-field training with Chris Starr. And as many of you already know, she is planning to transition to doing that same kind of pre-field training um, and also uh, on the field training by transitioning and moving to Spain. I'm not exactly sure what I think about that, but nevertheless, um, she is following the Lord's leadership uh, in her life. So today we're going to pray for her and God's blessing on her uh, training ministry for missionaries in Christar and also for her transition to serving in a different location. So if you would, please bow with me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the fact that you have provided for us. You have generously given to all of our needs. And Lord, we pray uh, to begin with that you would meet all of the needs of our individuals and families here at Community Bible Church, that you would abundantly supply for us so that we might be a blessing to others we pray that you would meet the needs for Community Bible Church through this offering. And then also, Lord, we pray that you would bless our investment in ministry and missions around the world. And today we specifically pray for Karen. We ask that you administer to her and use her in her capacity of training uh, pre-field missionaries. And then, Lord, as she kind of transitions and does a similar kind of ministry, but from the International Office for Christar in Spain, I pray, O oh God, that you would uh, minister to her and just guide her through all of the different details of uh, moving internationally, and we pray that your blessing would be upon her. In Jesus' name, amen.
righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in thy need, his power is displayed. To this I hope, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall. sure the price it has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overflow the grave to this I hold my sin has been defeated Jesus now
Thank you to the worship team for leading us in worship before the Lord this morning. We're going to read scripture briefly together and then I'll lead us in prayer before we dismiss our kids and have our message for this morning. So John chapter 10 verses 27 to 30 speaks of uh, Christ's character, his divinity, and also his shepherding ministry, his loving care for those who are his. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Uh, let's bow together for prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the Lord is our shepherd. And we can trust in you. And, and in this passage, we see the sheep of Jesus are never snatched from his hand or from your hand. Eternal life is secure in him. And also, the Father and the Son are one in their purpose to preserve your children. And so, Lord, we thank you for this steady purpose of the triune God that keeps us in your hand. We thank you for that and all of the peace and, and comfort that that can bring to us. And Lord, as we think about comfort this morning, our hearts go out to families, men and women, boys and girls in Israel who experienced over the past week a horrible atrocity by really a terrorist organization invading their homes, their farms, their festivals, and Lord, at times like this, it's almost hard for us to even know how to pray. Lord, our little words cannot match the horror that they have faced, and yet, Lord, your comfort and your grace, your peace, your healing, your intervention 
is exactly what they need. So, Lord, we pray that you would minister and be with those who have lost loved ones. Be with the leadership of the nation of Israel as they seek to protect their own. And, Lord, we pray that you would be also with those innocent civilians who are a part of the Gaza Strip, that they would be able to escape harm's way. And, Lord, we pray that you would defeat the terrorist organization that not only brought terror on Israel, but is bringing harm to their own people. Lord, we pray that you would defeat them and that, Lord, your peace would come to that region. We also pray that this would not escalate to a broader Middle Eastern conflict. And Lord, that you would save lives and minister in the midst of the terror that has reigned. Lord, at the same time, we think about our missionary who is in the Middle East. We pray, O oh God, that you would be with the Heshwas, Jamal and Susan. We pray, O oh God, that you would protect them and give them continued opportunity to minister there in that general region uh, where they are at. Lord, now we pray that you would give us um, peace and grace in our own hearts as we lift up these dear people. We also pray that you would help us to trust in you and your sovereign plans. The mystery behind what happens, Lord, we do not always understand, but help us to trust in you. And then, Lord, we pray that you would open up your word to our hearts today as we look again at Romans chapter 12. We pray that you would draw us near to you and that we would be guided by the Holy Spirit both as I speak and as together we listen to you and your word. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Boys and girls, second grade and down, you can be dismissed to go to your class at this time. Please be good for your leader and helper uh, today, and thank you for being with us so far. And for the rest of us, maybe you could please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. How many of you as parents have had at least one child who loved to take things apart? Anybody? Got some kids that love to take things apart? Well, um, we had at least one who was especially proficient at taking things apart. He shall remain unnamed to protect the guilty, but at the same time, he loved to take things apart. Um, actually, he was also pretty, um, pretty good at uh, putting them back together. But what was the fun in doing that, right? Why would you want to put them all back together? Uh, nevertheless, uh, for a long time at our house, uh, there were a couple of electric guitars that had parts hanging out the back of them. Um, somehow they still worked. I even checked on one of them this morning, and it's still sort of patched together with duct tape to hold in all of the stuff that had been taken in and out a number of different times. Well, sometimes when we come to a passage like Romans chapter 12, we do have to kind of take it apart. Um, we have to look at things, maybe even word by word by word, but by the end of both kind of this series on Romans chapter 12, as well as by the end of this morning's sermon, I do intend to put at least part of it back together, maybe a little bit like Legos, so that we can see what it's all about. So I'm going to do a reminder to sort of take a look at the big picture once again of the geography of the larger context of Romans chapter 12 and even the book of Romans this morning. And then we're going to dive into one verse and one verse really only kind of for our text this morning, Romans chapter 12, verse number 12. But we need to remember that chapter 12 has entered into Paul's explanation and encouragement related to Christian living. And, and so sort of the practical portion of this book, it's, it's very dense starting in chapter 12. Now, that's not to say that the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans haven't also included a number of different practical sections. So we could think of chapter 6 dealing with temptation. We could think of chapter 7 dealing with the reality of remaining indwelling sin in the hearts of believers, in the lives of believers. Chapter 8 lifts us to the heights of Christian security in Christ and Christian hope in the future. And, and then, of course, the other chapters packed around those chapters before and after, have dealt with foundational doctrines. So we have the foundational doctrine of human sin, and we have the foundational doctrine of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, 
in Christ alone. And then Paul moves into this practical Christian living, kind of a primer on practical Christian living. And we've talked, uh, again, this was weeks ago, but we talked about chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And that is this great call to present our bodies, or really our entire lives, as a sacrifice to the Lord. To surrender and to commit ourselves to obedience and to His will, based on the mercies of God, based on His gracious dealings with us. And then in verses 3 through 8, we talked at least a week or two about spiritual gifts and how those impact our own individual Christian lives, but also how spiritual gifts uh, find their place in the life of the church congregation as well. And then I pointed out how verses 9 down to the end of the chapter, verse 21, there is like this rapid fire bullet point presentation regarding a number of different Christian priorities related to our relationships, related to our relationships both within the Christian family and with unbelievers, those outside the church as well. I don't know if you remember this, but a few weeks ago, I kind of talked about this section, verses 9 to 22, 21, as a recipe, a recipe for uh, loving relationships. And we talked about the core ingredient, sort of like the base flour, so to speak. The core ingredient would be love, and we saw that in verse number 9. Let love be genuine. And then we talked about sort of the basic flavor that we're expecting from this recipe, and it was a commitment for good, or commitment to good, and a rejection of evil. And We saw that also in verse number 9. Abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. There's mention of this in verse number 17 as well. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And then again at the very end, verse number 21. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And so there was this core ingredient of love for our relationships. And there was also this sort of basic expectation of a flavor of commitment to good and rejection of evil. And then I sort of continued on with that illustration. The correct temperature in which to bake this cake of relationships would be dependence upon the Holy Spirit. And we saw that in verse number 11, right in the middle of the verse, be fervent in spirit, which probably should be translated, be fervent in the spirit, in the Holy Spirit. In other words, we can't build good, godly, loving relationships, either with people inside the church or outside the church, believers or unbelievers, (coughs) without dependence upon the ministry of and the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's kind of the big geography of where we've been, and we've been plowing through some of these bullet points of how to build these or maybe bake these uh, Christian relationships. So in verse number 10, we talked about love one another with brotherly affection. Um, Then in verse number 11, kind of, again, this bullet point kind of approach, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in the spirit, serve the Lord. And now we have come to verse number 12. This will be our primary focus for this morning. Verse number 12, a powerful staccato kind of verse that again hits three primary points. Verse number 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. I'm going to take these great themes a little bit out of order. We're actually going to start in the middle and end at the beginning because of just some of the priorities of what I want to point out this morning. But there is an outline in the bulletin if that's something that will help you in following along. Even for our young kids, um, there's some um, keywords for kids. The idea is you can put a hash mark every time I use one of those words to help you keep going with me during the sermon. And I believe for the adults, there's some blanks to fill in if you would like to use that in following along as well. Christian living requires patience in trials. Christian living requires patience in trials. And of course, that comes from the very middle of this verse. Be patient in tribulation. So to begin with this morning, we need to consider kind of the reality of trials and tribulations in a Christian's life. 
We need to recognize that this is going to be a part of our existence. As Christians, we will experience suffering. We will experience trials, natural trials, as well as directed tribulations and persecutions. So there's a couple of passages of Scripture that I want to relate to this morning. So give me the slide there for John chapter 16, verse number 33. Jesus speaks these words to his followers. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So Christ is using a contrast here. He's saying that in him we will have and experience an internal peace. But in the world, in our existence until glory, we will experience an external tribulation. We will suffer. We will be troubled. There will be difficulties in our life, some of which will be a result of just living in a sinful world, some of which may be a result of our own sin and God's discipline on us, and some of which may be because we are a Christian and the world hates Christ and therefore it will hate, hate us. And then he says, take heart, ultimately I have overcome the world. So in the end, tribulations will be over, persecutions will be over because of Christ's ultimate victory. And then uh, another verse that kind of hits on this same note is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 12. A short, pithy verse, again from the Apostle Paul. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So there is a reality of opposition and sometimes direct persecution against those who belong to Christ. If we want to live a godly life, we will be like sandpaper on the smooth perspective of the world that just wants to live for the here and now. And so there is the reality of trials and tribulations in a Christian's life, but we also need to consider the value, the value of those trials and tribulations in a Christian's life. And there's this kind of unique verse tucked into Psalm 119. Many of you know Psalm 119 simply because it's a chapter that's the longest chapter in the Bible, and also it's all about God's Word. But, but look at this. It also has a strong theme related to suffering and affliction. Look at this. Psalm 119, verse number 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. There's something about the experience of trials and difficulties in our lives that directs us, that points us in the proper and correct direction, that gives us a focus on Christ, gives us a focus on God, and helps us to set aside the straying tendencies of our own hearts. So the value of trials in a Christian life is it actually points us in the right direction. Greater dependence upon God and dependence upon His grace. So this verse, our verse, in Romans chapter 12, verse number 12, calls for us to be patient in these trials. To be patient. So again, rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. And that means a couple of different things, right? So to the call for patience in the middle of tribulations, that means something very simply. And by the way, um, a lot of times you know how I say put your thinking cap on? You don't even need a thinking cap for this one. If we need to be patient during tribulations, that means that the tribulations are probably going to last longer than we would have originally hoped. Right? If we are going to need some patience in the midst of those tribulations, the call for patience means that they're going to last a while. We would... We cannot expect that God will remove the irritations, that God will remove the, even the persecution the instant that we become uncomfortable. These trials, these tribulations mean that um, there's going to be discomfort in our lives and because we need patience means that they're going to last. They sometimes last a long time. Second, being patient in tribulation means that we learn the lessons 
that God has for us in those tribulations. Or maybe the way that Martin Lloyd-Jones says it in his commentary on this passage is simply this. We need to learn the lessons that only tribulation can teach us. And there's, there's a handful of those kinds of lessons. So first of all, um, we need to learn about ourselves. We need to learn about ourselves. In the midst of trials, difficulties, and tribulations, we recognize that sometimes we are not as humble and we are more proud than we thought. We sometimes realize that we are less submissive and more rebellious than we thought. It's like, Lord, why? Why am I still in this pain or this painful situation? Or why hasn't this circumstance changed? And we kind of express sometimes out of that pain, we express a heart of rebellion that was actually there all along. Uh, we are perhaps more self-interested and less selfless than we normally would think if life is just kind of clicking along easily for us. Tribulation reveals things about our hearts. And then also we need to learn not only about ourselves, but we need to learn about the world around us. Tribulation reminds us that this world is shallow, it's fickle, it's empty, and it's unsatisfying. It'll turn on you in an instant, right? The hymn writer wrote it this way, Is this vile world a friend of grace to help me on to God? And sometimes it takes persecution or tribulation to remind us of that reality. Also, tribulation or trials remind us of the anticipated glory of heaven, right? that our ultimate destination, we were created to live in the very presence of God, and that is our destination, either at our death or at the coming of Christ. Also, trials teach us empathy for others. In an illustration of this, in a sermon that I read this past week, uh, someone said that sometimes it takes a sickness or an operation for a healthy person to have real sympathy for someone who's experienced ongoing chronic illness. And perhaps that is true for some of us, that trials and tribulation teach us empathy for those who have suffered perhaps so much more than we have. Christian living requires patience during trials. Suffering is never welcome. We are not called upon to create our own suffering, but we do need to accept and even welcome the lessons that God wants to teach us through patience in tribulations. That's what it means to be patient in trials. Now, number two, Christian living requires steadfastness in prayer. Christian living requires steadfastness in prayer. So we see that at the end of verse number 12, be constant in prayer. Be constant in prayer. So the word constant perhaps could be translated persistent, uh, to apply ourselves to. In fact, the definition would just simply be this, to apply oneself diligently to something. To apply oneself diligently to something. So um, <clears throat> you may not be a professional prayer, Right? I'm not a professional prayer. You may not be even proficient at prayer. But the idea of being constant in prayer is that if we will apply ourselves diligently to addressing God, to coming before the throne of grace, to bringing to Him our hearts and our needs and our lives in submission and in request, then we will, we will see God work. There's a sense in which as we practice prayer, we will experience greater and greater communion with him. Now, prayer emphasizes a couple of things, and this is a, a note that we have seen again and again and again in messages from the book of Romans. But prayer reminds us of our dependent posture, our dependent status. We are dependent upon God for absolutely everything, Everything physically, emotionally, relationally, and spiritually, we are dependent upon Him. We, we talked about that somewhat in verse number 11 when we talked about being fervent in the Spirit. We are dependent upon the provision 
the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit for anything and everything in our Christian lives. And we should express that in prayer. I remember um, kind of when I finally became an adult and started paying to, uh, attention to my pastor's sermons in Longview, Texas, where I grew up, I remember he said, the best prayer that God most wants to hear is simply this, God, I need you. Lord, I need you. So prayer emphasizes our dependent status. Also, prayer emphasizes the spiritual struggle. In fact, we might even call it the spiritual warfare of Christian living. Right? So we are talking in this context about tribulations. Right? So be patient in tribulations. And prayer reminds us that there are unseen things happening around us and sometimes even in us when it comes to temptations and attacks from the evil one. And prayer is our only recourse. We cry out to God to bring his power to bear on an attack or a temptation that we feel helpless to rebuff. I also want to say a couple of things about why we pray. Why do Christians pray? There, think about it. Um, people, m many people go through their entire lives and practically never pray. It might be just the occasional prayer for something that they really, really want or if they're in a very stressful situation. But nevertheless, why do Christians pray and why should we pray and why, why should we, maybe I should just say it this way, why should we pray more? to express this dependence upon the Lord. Well, we pray to remind ourselves of the nearness of God. That, that God is present now. So there is this sense in which prayer is coming before the throne of grace and we think of it in terms of approaching heaven itself. But also, we pray because God is right here with us, indeed even in us, hearing our very thoughts and requests. And he is near to undertake for us. So we remind ourselves of the nearness and the presence of God. But also, we pray also, especially during times of difficulty, to, to remind ourselves that the difficulties on the outside and the weaknesses on the inside of our very souls are still under the sovereign hand of God. So we are, let's say we're praying about a particular temptation that we feel especially weak to resist. And we're saying, Lord, this is still under your control. And you can either remove the temptation or you can give me the strength to resist that temptation. You can work in these situations both outside Ins and inside of me. We are talking to the one who can do something about it. Possibly we should think of prayer as if we should be more and more like a little child walking in the dark. There is something childlike about prayer to begin with. But if we think of a little child walking in the dark and they, they have an adult friend or a parent with them, and very often children will, children will, um, <clears throat> they'll talk and they'll talk out loud, right? Because they're afraid of the dark and they're reminding themselves that the adult is still there with them, right? In the midst of that darkness. I, something similar to that, I remember uh, one time going to a theme park. Um, I believe, if I remember correctly, it was Bush Gardens down in Florida. And uh, our older two boys, they rode together on this um, roller coaster, and then it was my job to ride with Hudson. He was probably about nine years old, and he was just barely meeting the height criteria for all of these different rides, and Daddy had to endure these <laughs> rides with him. And we rode this, what felt like a pretty rickety, wooden-type um, roller coaster, and <laughs> stops, and now it's all quiet again. I heard Hudson next to me quoting Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Right? He was reminding himself that he was in the hands of God. 
right, in the, in the terror of this roller coaster. Well, life can be like a roller coaster, and when we face the darkness of life, we should be more constant in prayer, reminding ourselves of the nearness of the living God. And then number three, number three, the foundation of Christian joy is Christian hope. The foundation of Christian joy is Christian hope. And of course, now I'm doing what I mentioned earlier. I'm kind of putting us in reverse and going back to this very foundational phrase. And this is first, because it is foundational, rejoice in hope. Rejoice in hope. By the way, it's, it's foundational because we are not going to be able to be patient in tribulation and we are not going to be constant in prayer except for Christian joy and Christian hope. So I want to start with hope and then I'll move on to Christian joy. So let me explain a couple of things. And, and this is, in a sense, part of where we're kind of, we've taken some of this verse apart. Now we're going to start putting it back together. So let me start with hope. Hope is not the idea of I hope so, maybe so. Like every year I hope that I'll get a significant tax return. But that is often disappointed, right? So this is not a, in the Bible, hope, Christian hope, New Testament hope, hope in God is not a hope so, maybe so. It is not a circumstantial desire, right? So the idea of hope in the New Testament is a confident Christian expectation. It is a confident Christian expectation. So here are some examples. We confidently expect that God will keep all of his promises because he has always kept them before. We confidently expect that unfulfilled prophecies will be fulfilled because Previous prophecies have been fulfilled again and again and again and again. So ultimately, we confidently expect the coming of our Lord to set all things right and to establish his kingdom because of all the fulfilled prophecies that led up to his first coming and his cross and his resurrection. We have this confident expectation. And this Christian confident expectation is focused both in the present, the here and now, as well as in our future hope as well. So we have both a present and a future hope. Now, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about our future hope, and I want you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. The future hope of all Christians is summarized in this glorious passage in Romans chapter 8. And we're going to start by reading a little bit from verse number 22. So Romans 8, 22 says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. That is a very picturesque and poetic way of kind of talking about the destruction, the death, the darkness, the brokenness of our entire world. The whole creation has been groaning because of sin. Verse number 23, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, we also groan who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. This is, again, a picturesque way of expressing our ultimate Christian hope of the coming of our Lord and our being taken up to be together with Him in the clouds and then ultimately reigning with Him here upon the earth as well. The redemption of our bodies, a resurrection body, and our being... a the full adoption being complete. Folks, we've experienced adoption. And let me tell you something, there's a lot of paperwork that has to be signed about adoption. Our salvation has been signed and sealed. But as we waited for the girls to come home on an airplane from Africa 
to be with us. That is like the second coming of Christ. There will, we will literally be in his presence. That's the full completion of even a human adoption. And so he uses that analogy there, that we will be with the Lord. Look at verse number 24. He brings in hope here. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? In other words, there's an aspect of these unfulfilled prophecies related to the coming of the Lord. We haven't seen them yet. They haven't been fulfilled yet. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Our ultimate hope is the return of Christ and the establishment of his kingdom, as well as the completion of God's work in us and also restoring all things, setting all things right and straight, judging evil and reigning on this earth. And then also, uh, we have a present hope that God isn't just sort of like waiting around until the moment that he is ordained for the second coming of Christ. God's at work now as well. That is our present hope. And so maybe turn with me backwards again to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. That, you know, it's, it's worth doing a study of every time the idea of hope comes up in the book of Romans. This is a key and core idea in the book of Romans. But again, turn and look with me at Romans chapter 5. And again, this is something that I mentioned earlier during the introduction of the message, that there is this foundational doctrine of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. He mentions that in verse number one. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope. So does that sound familiar, right? Rejoice in hope. Rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, in the archives on the website, there's a whole sermon on that section. So I'm not going to repeat that sermon, but however, what I am going to do is just point out how it relates to hope. So our present hope is that God is even now processing us through towards this goal of being in his presence and being fully conformed to his image. That God is going to restore all things and we ourselves will even be what he created us to be in his presence. So look at some of these key words and some of these key ideas. Look at verse number two at the end. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Even now, God is being glorified in us, in our suffering circumstances, and in the molding of our character. And that is hopeful. That is hopeful. Sometimes I wonder myself, does my life glorify the Lord? Well, it certainly can as I respond in hope to difficult circumstances in my life. Also, uh, verses uh, 3 and 4, he talks about rejoicing and suffering, and suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. There is this reality that God is working at refashioning us, even through suffering and endurance. He is changing our character, that sort of character-building reality of suffering and difficulty and that that is happening even now. We are not just waiting for the ultimate fullness of our changed character. God is changing our character even now. And then even in this process, even in this process, God's love, verse number five, is being poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Our lives are a demonstration of the love of God when he is working this process in us of changing our character into his image. And again and again and again, we saw the word hope interwoven into that passage, which means that there is hope interwoven into this process that God uses to change and mold our character. So think about it this way. Suffering is discouraging. Folks, can we just say character building is discouraging? 
And when God is working on us and changing us. But nevertheless, we have hope. We have the confident expectation that God knows what he is doing now. And he will complete that process when Christ returns. He will accomplish his will and his work in us. And that, that confident expectation should lead to joy. It should lead to rejoicing. By the way, by the way, this hope, this confident expectation, it is a steady, stable reality. Sometimes theologians call this an indicative. They're kind of using a grammar term. It is, it is to make a statement. We have this bedrock reality that God is at work and will complete his work in us. Whether we feel this reality or not, whether we even believe in this reality or not, this confident expectation is real and we are called simply to rejoice in it, right? And rejoicing is an outward expression of inward joy. Rejoicing is joy expressed in thanksgiving. Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing in my life. It is expressed in praise, and it is expressed in prayer, depending upon him. Um, joy, this rejoicing is joy expressed also in, and I'm going to say this and then explain it, so listen carefully. It is joy expressed in a peaceful, stable optimism. And, and here's what I mean. It is an optimism that God's in control, and that he knows what he's doing, and that his plans are on track. We may feel like we've taken 50 steps backwards in life or in our trajectory or whatever it may be. But we can have a peaceful, stable optimism that God is in control and that his plans are on track and that he knows what he is doing. And so because this hope, this Christian confident expectation is a stable, static, real reality then our joy should be a steady, regular choice for every Christian, right? That we would remind ourselves, even in the waves of storms and difficulties, we'd remind ourselves that we can rejoice in a God who is working these things for our good. Is that not also in Romans chapter 8, that all things work together for good for those who are the called and those who are according to his purpose? Now, let me kind of make a couple of final comments, a couple of things to notice and remember, and then I'll wrap up with some application. So we should remember, as I have just preached, that this hope is a steady state reality. Right? This is God is doing this stuff, right? And he will fulfill his promises. It is a confident expectation. And the flip side, the same thing is true in this life that struggle and tribulation and trials are also just a reality of life. Now, they come and go. They go up and down. Sometimes they are more or less intense. But nevertheless, in this life, struggle, trials, tribulations, temptations will be a reality to be met with the greater reality of our Christian confident expectation in God. And then also, we need to remember what I said at the beginning of this message in our little review, that these exhortations, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, they are actually in the context of relationships. So remember, you can see this in Romans chapter 12, verse number 10, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Look down at verse number 13 following verse number 12, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you and bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. So the context is a relational context. And so it is in the context of relationships, both with believers and unbelievers, that we are called upon to rejoice in our Christian confident expectation we are to live out of this joy and hope. We are called to be patient in tribulation, even when that tribulation seems to come. And we are to be constant in prayer, praying for ourselves and others in the context of relationship. 
So how might we apply these things to our hearts this morning? Well, are we rejoicing in hope, being patient in tribulation, and being constant in prayer? So is our hope, is our hope for life and eternity and the everyday bumps and bruises, ups and downs, is it grounded in God? Is it grounded in God's sovereign work and his will and his plans, both for us and for this world? Is our hope, is our confident expectation grounded in him? I mean, we have to be honest. We have to be, Christians would be completely hypocritical if we weren't honest. Things like war in the Middle East or in Europe, things like war seem like a setback for the world and for what seems like should be the good plans of God for this world. But God is at work doing sometimes what we don't know and may never know until eternity. But is our competent expectation grounded in him and his sovereign will work and plans for both us individually and for the world? Or is it possible that somehow we have set our hopes on ourselves and our own capacities? That's a setup for disappointment. And that's uh, an understatement, right? Okay, so if we have placed our hopes in ourselves and our own capacities, we'll be utterly wiped out with disappointment and despair. Or if we have placed our hopes somehow in this world and its system of accomplishment and change, we will ultimately be disappointed. The world system is in opposition to God and his plans and his will and his work. So are we rejoicing in hope? And, and is there enough bedrock, and I'm just going to say this this way, is there enough bedrock theology in your heart, truth in your heart about God and his character and God and his plans? Is there enough of that that you can live a stable, steady, joyful, even, may I say, Christianly optimistic life? in this world. The bombs may be falling around us emotionally and even spiritually around this world, but are, is our sights set on God so that we can be joyful? And then also, second part of this verse, are we patient in tribulations? Do we rail against trials or do we recognize the work of God in them? Sometimes we can't see them, but we call our hearts to trust? Are we patient in tribulation? And then are we constant in prayer? Are we constant in prayer? So just sort of the reality of our dependent status and the reality of the spiritual warfare that sometimes is unseen, but we feel or sense. We know that we're being tempted. We know that evil is around us. That that raging war around us, does it sometimes force us to our knees or do we resist? Are we people of prayer? Let's go before the Lord now for a moment of prayer. And if you would, please um, take a few moments to respond to this one short, simple, kind of bullet point vo verse. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. If you take a few moments to respond, and then I'll lead us in our closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for these exhortations that remind us of our Christian confident expectation in you and your promises and in your character. We thank you also, O oh Lord, for um, calling us to prayer. Help us to remember your constant near us, nearness to us. And um, Lord, also give us grace to be patient under tribulation. Even as we see the world, at times it seems, falling apart around us, Lord, we 
may face greater and greater tribulation. Lord, help us to be patient even in that. May our hearts and our hope and our joy be set in you. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to uh, sing together in response to what God has spoken to us in his word. We're going to sing um, All Glory Be to Christ. So if you would please stand and let's sing together. Thank you, worship team. You may be seated. We're going to welcome in two new members. Um, if, if you guys are still prepared for this, so Jimmy 
and Sharon Gore have uh, been a part of our church in the past. They moved away to Texas, and they've come back. I'm not going to say anything about the promised land during that comment, but you guys come on up. They've moved back recently and are ready to um, <coughs> be a part of our church again. So um, thank you guys for coming. And go ahead. Thank you. All right, so Marshall and Nicole, you can be seated for the first part here. And um, then Jimmy and Sharon, we're going to welcome you into membership. So come on over here, right front and center. I know. <laughs> um, so uh, when, when did you move away? I'm trying to remember. Uh, 2018. Okay, 2018. So a few years in Texas there. And now a job and family has moved you back to our area here in DeMott. And uh, it's wonderful to have you back. And so uh, normally I would like to ask you to share your salvation testimony to uh, the congregation. So if you would just share with us how you came to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And we'll start with Sharon and then go to Jimmy and uh, then we'll welcome you into membership. I guess you could say I did grow up in a Christian home, but for me, um, becoming a true believer probably happened in my later years of life. There were a few years that I did struggle, but um, ultimately I knew that um, my life had to be led for the Lord because um, he's our hope. And um, even more so now with the way the world is really changing and now that we have children, we need to make sure that we are guiding them in the right direction, but also making sure we are going in the right direction because um, the end will be near. Mm -hmm. We don't know when. It could be millions of years or 10 years or five or two. Who knows? But um, we just need to be grounded in our faith. And so I made sure that um, when I recommitted my life to the Lord that I was going to do it the best way that I knew. And who are you trusting for the forgiveness of your sins? Jesus. Amen. So, Jimmy, share with us. Uh, your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And Jimmy, who are you trusting for the forgiveness of your sins? Amen. Well, if you are a member of Community Bible Church, would you please respond to this question? If you uh, are in favor of receiving Sharon Gore into membership, please say amen. amen. And if you are in favor of receiving Jimmy Gore into membership of Community Bible Church, please say amen. 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 Thank you so much. And uh, Marshall and Nicole, we look forward to seeing you grow in the faith and um, when that time comes for you.
and to seeing you with your parents is really a delight, and it's wonderful to have you guys back. Is it okay if I have you greet the folks as they leave today? Is that sure? sure? All right, so we'll dismiss you guys. <laughs> I do all kinds of things where I spring stuff on people, um, but thank you for being <laughs> receptive to that. So once they make it to the back, I'll uh, watch for that, and we'll be dismissed, and you can welcome them into the Fellowship of Community Bible Church. It has uh, been a blessing and a privilege to uh, worship with you here today. Uh, go in the grace of the Lord. You're dismissed. <laughs>